For today's tea, we spoke with UNT's first black female SGA president, Yolian Ogabu, for an exclusive interview that you don't want to miss. Also, president of UNT's Blackout Alliance, Brooke Roberson, joins today's tea to discuss homophobia in the black community. Then, we hit the streets to gauge the power of black Twitter, but before you sip that tea, let's show you what's going on in our community. for you to be, except for here on Today's, today's Tea. UNT is now classified as a Minority Serving Institution, or MSI for short. This means that people of color at UNT are now in the majority. According to the 2017-2018 report from UNT's Institution of Equity and Diversity, around 32% of faculty members are non-white. And of that percentage, only 5% are African American. So why do you guys feel that it is important to have teachers who represent you? Um, I would say because it makes the process a little bit easier to relate and to get through certain situations that um, some of our counterparts may not have to experience. Um, that's my main thing is being able to go to someone that looks like you and may deal with the same things that, you know, some people may not have to go through and how they got through it. Well, overall, I just think it's important to have people that look like you in, in positions of higher power, just in general in all aspects of life. But in, in education, if you want to go and get your master's, it's nice to see your people, well, to see professors of that caliber teaching those courses. And I think specifically, because I am interested in like AFR, African American Studies, um, obviously those classes need to be taught by African American people. So um, if it's not, it's kind of, just like here, I think we have race gender media class. And I think this is the first semester that's been taught by a black woman. Whereas before, it's kind of like, yeah, I get you, you know, you're teaching from a book, but as a white woman, how can you really relate to everything that you're teaching about? Mm -hmm. I agree. How do minority students learn in an environment where so few of their teachers look like them? Reagan and I spoke with Dr. Barbara Bush, who serves as the master's program coordinator in UNT's College of Education. She shared how UNT can help its faculty be more reflective of the students they serve. One of the things you have to consider in increasing the number of faculty of color is actually having academic administrators of color. If you don't have those individuals and they're not committed to having a diverse faculty, then you're not going to have a diverse faculty. The American Council on Education, or ACE for short, recently released a comprehensive report on race and ethnicity in higher education. The report found that black students who started in the fall of 2011 had the lowest completion rates and highest dropout rates. UNT junior Trevion McWilliams said the lack of faculty diversity affects retention. I think if kids don't find themselves in spaces with other people that look like them, I think it could cause a bit of a distraction because they find themselves doing things they probably shouldn't or being in places where they probably probably could do a little bit better. I think if we have a lot more professors or staff or faculty members that look like us or, um, or are like us, I think we can develop more not only as a student body but also as a university. Bush said the Black Faculty Network is working behind closed doors to increase diversity among faculty. But in the meantime, she said students have the critical mass to evoke change now. I think we have to exercise the power that we have. I think a lot of kids don't know about some of the spaces that we have to um, voice out our opinions, especially when it comes to school. I mean, you look at these spot evaluations every year. McWilliams said he hopes UNT expands its diversity beyond the classroom to administrators and even the Board of Regents. For Today's Tea, I'm Jasmine C. Johnson. Just a few weeks ago, UNT announced its first ever African-American woman as president of Student Government Association, or SGA for short. I spoke with SGA presidential-elect Yolian Ogabu on what it took to win. It's time that UNT reflects this, reflects you, and reflects us. I still feel like I'm feeling it's kind of like euphoric, like, I don't even know. I just cannot believe it's real. I want it to start being like a normal thing that like black women are running every year. And so the fact that that hasn't happened until like just now is crazy. Like even being like a super young, like running as a sophomore, like apparently isn't a thing either. And so um, kind of adding all those together, not only made it really difficult during the campaign trail, but it's worth it that, you know, we won. I'm really excited, this is awesome. <laughs>
Looking for a place to host your next family outing? Don't go anywhere. We'll show you where on today's tea. A decades-long wrong has been righted in the Southeast End. I spoke with a local couple who didn't take no for an answer in a zoning dispute over their business. Acts of Kindness brought Tammy, Manuel, and Deb together at 511 Robertson Street on Thanksgiving at Clara's Kitchen. Manuel Gooden and Tammy Bradley, co-owners of the restaurant, started it to share soul food with the community and named it Clara's after Gooden's mother. As part of that vision, the couple provided Thanksgiving dinner to the homeless. Prior to the holiday, the couple had applied for a certificate of occupancy, which would allow it to operate as a commercial restaurant. The application was rejected, which meant the restaurant would continue to operate under residential constraints. As a residential establishment, the restaurant could only cater, but couldn't accept payment for services, hence the free dinner. After learning Deb is a council member, the couple shared their concerns with her. They asked why they were denied a CO when business owners before them had success. We actually was denied and other minority business owners before us was denied as well. Our mentor told Bradley they were denied a CO because the property was zoned residential, but she informed them that it could be rezoned and told them how to do so. Our mentor said she was adamant on helping the council correct a wrong because bad zoning can essentially end up being segregation. After a series of meetings with the city's planning and zoning committee, the committee unanimously approved the zoning change and the council followed suit. The city charges a rezoning fee, but given the circumstances, decided to waive the fee. It's not a favor. <laughs> it's just a way of making a very pretty small reparations um, for what uh, not just Tammy Emanuel, um, but, but previous business owners here and their customers uh, in, in Southeast Denton have been through for so long. It's a way of just acknowledging in, in a real concrete way, other than just simply saying, we're sorry. <laughs> um, that the, the, city, the city screwed up um, and, and we want to we wanna make it right. With the dispute resolved, the couple is now focused on sharing Clara's food while also inspiring the Southeast End community with what Gooden calls something for us. For today's tea, I'm Jasmine C. Johnson. Why paint with a twist when you can paint with kinfolk? The Arlington Studio offers a soul-inspired painting experience like no other. Jasmine and Reagan hit up kinfolk himself to see what the hype was all about. On any given day, you can find Derek Williams dancing, vibing, but most importantly painting at the studio. CEO artist of Let's Paint with Kinfolk got his start in 2015 after friends told him to host paint parties. Williams decided to check out Painting with a Twist and as a result started sketching his own images. After Sensational Cakes booked him for his first paint party, he continued hosting them part time. But a massive layoff at his full time job encouraged him to really pursue his dreams. Well, when I uh, got laid off, man, I just read my mind, you know, I'm going I'm to try this. So I took my pension, opened it up, and like I said, it's been a blessing. I have a great, great fan base. While he credits painting with a twist as a pioneer of the industry, Williams takes pride in offering his customers a unique experience. I put a little flavor to it for you. So that's the difference between me and Painting with Twist. I'll, put, I'll actually put a twist on it at the end. In the next five years, he hopes to have two to three more studios open across the Metroplex. For today's tea, I'm Jasmine C. Johnson. What's your favorite family reunion song? Queen Bee just added her latest remix to The Running. When we come back, we'll discuss how Beyonce is still securing the bag from Baychella. Beauty may be in the eye of the beholder, but even in the black community, the beholder often tends to follow Eurocentric beauty standards, which consists of fair skin and straight hair. Today, we'll talk about two isms that affect our community, colorism and texturism. Alice Walker, the author of The Color Purple, is credited for coining the term colorism. She defined it as preferential treatment of same race people based solely on their color. Texturism suggests that your hair texture is also an indicator of your superiority. So ladies, what was your first encounter with colorism and texturism? So my first encounter with colorism was unfortunately one of my very own family members, a cousin of mine. Um, and then it started in elementary school of where I was bullied for years and years. And it did a, it did a really big toll on my self-esteem and mental health and everything. So yeah, that was my first encounter with colorism. But then with texturism in particular, it also was with um, my very own family member. I'm not going to say who that was, but... Yeah, it's just, it happens in the family and it's very unfortunate that it's the case and a lot of people just don't know about the conversations of colorism and texturism. What about you guys? For me, I haven't really, I mean obviously I know that texturism exists, but that hasn't really been my experience. Uh, I'm more so with the colorism. Like Carla said, my first encounter 
probably, I'm sure it happened all through elementary school, but you just don't internalize that. I, I've always kind of been not really popular, but I knew a lot of people, so that wasn't my identity. You know, it wasn't just how I looked. I was smart, I was athletic, so I didn't really pay much, I didn't put much stock into my appearance. But uh, it was a cousin of, uh, of mine that definitely said something, at, her son was dating a girl, and the girl happened to be dark skinned, and the, the mom made a comment, something like, you know, why she gotta be dark skinned? And I'm just like, well, what do you think I am? You know, wow. so just like, and like you said, that's the, uh, as we define, it's often within the community. So these comments are going to come often from people that are closest to you because right. that's, that's just often how it happens. But yeah, I'm, I'm just glad we're talking about it now. Yeah, um, with colorism, it is intrapersonal as opposed to racism, which is interpersonal. So with colorism, it can be those in, within your own race discriminating against you. Whereas with racism, it's someone outside of your race. So. So how has media worked to change this narrative that uh, straight hair is better than kinky hair and that dark skin is less than light skin? Well, I think a good example to point out would be um, Lupita Nyong'o. Uh, she's from Kenya. She's Kenyan-Mexican. Very interesting. And she came out at around the time that I was in, a freshman in high school and that really, really helped me out with gaining my self-worth, my self-esteem and everything because she talked about colorism. And from what I know is that she's about to release a book later in the year addressing colorism, a children's book, to help little kids grow confidence. I would say just seeing more of um, those reporters and anchors on television mm -hmm. um, that are well representing of the black community, um, not just dark skinned girls, but also light skinned girls, a, a variation of both to show the world that, you know, there's, there's not one that's um, better than the other. Um, we all have different skin tones and um, we should all embrace it. So just definitely seeing ourselves in these roles on um, films and also on the news. Like with Black Panther and the last right. movie. I have never seen a film of where like the whole cast of the film was all dark skin. That was fascinating. Black Panther was right. beautiful. Yes, Black Panther and the Us movie both had that and I was just like, wow. And also worth noting, the black women weren't just over, overly sexualized. Yes, like right. it was like, they didn't have any hair. They were just beautiful, just like in their own right. They were fully covered, you know, just, yes. you could just focus on their essence. And I think that was really important. And it was so uh, deliberate. I think that's that's a, what I've noticed now. It's like, it's not just so by, it just, you know, by coincidence that it happens to be dark skinned people. It's like we're casting mm -hmm. dark skinned people. And I feel like that's, that's the key shift that we've been needing. And like even Issa Rae with Insecure, Right. That cast, it's like she, she, I believe in interviews, she's like deliberately said, I want people that look like me on my shows. And so like, and it's important to see that. And, that, and I think that's what makes me like gravitate towards those shows. Speaking of colorism, here at UNC, a couple of months ago, I got to meet in person Amara La Negra. You probably don't know her. She's Afro-Latina. She's on the show uh, Love and Hip Hop, I think. Yeah, and she's really beautiful, really nice. And she has been very outspoken about colorism within the black community, within the Latin American community. Colorism is just something that happens within in basically all minority groups. It happens in the black community, the Latin community, the Asian community, it's everywhere. Indian community, it's like yes. once, because I'm doing my thesis on colorism, um, and yeah, it's deep-rooted, not just here, it's everywhere. In fact, if you look up on Twitter, the hashtag uh, unfair and lovely. Yes, I know. Yeah, so yeah, that's a movement to like highlight dark skin and like all aspects of the world. Mm -hmm. it's, it's pretty big, so yeah, when you get a chance, look that up. From weaves to braids to froze, a huge aspect of black culture is our hair. However, despite being the number one consumers of hair and beauty products, as far as ownership in the industry, black people have barely even scratched the surface. So who exactly dominates the market and how did it happen? The answer might come as surprising to some. Take a look. Worldwide, according to the Black Owned Beauty Supply Association, BOBSA for short, the black hair and cosmetic market is a $9 billion industry. And according to a report titled The Multicultural Edge, Rising Super Consumers, in 2017 alone, black people in the U.S. made up nearly 86% of the entire industry sales. Yet at the same time, black people only make up around 14% of the U.S. population. And although black people purchase nine times more in beauty products than any other demographic, according to the official Black Wall Street, African Americans own less than 1% of the market share. 
Trinsetter's Beauty Supply is part of the less than 1%, the first and currently the only black-owned beauty supply in Denton. Support for the black community and support because a majority of them are considered the heart of that, that business. If I did not have the support from the black-owned community, and I say 97% of it are our target market, then our business would fail. It's a, a niche market, but at the same time, it's a necessity. At one point in time, black people operated the vast majority of black beauty products. However, today, according to the National Federation of Beauty Suppliers, Koreans now control more than 70% of the industry. This all started happening in the 1960s, when Korean immigrants began selling wigs to black women. According to the Choson Ilbul, a Korean newspaper, a document was found in 1965 where Korean wig manufacturers convinced the Korean government to outlaw the export of raw hair from those who weren't Korean manufacturers. Then, six months later, the the U.S. government banned the import of hair made in China, which gave Korean firms the opportunity to have a monopoly on the market. Joanne Zhang, co-owner of Beauty Town Hair Supply in DeSoto, says why she believes Korean immigrants continue to stay in the industry decades later. When immigrants want to open small businesses in other countries, they could face lots of problems because everything will be so difficult than opening business in their uh, own countries. It is much easier to open similar businesses as other immigrants who came here earlier and opened because they can share some information. Like other black-owned beauty supplies, Trendsetter's owner Robert Rice did have some difficulties with getting competitive and highly demanded products on his shelves. Robert says that since Korean people have a monopoly on the market, a lot of times distributors only do business with other Korean people who speak Korean. In the past and still today, this language barrier is also seen with black hair business magazines of where copies are only written and printed in Korean. Despite this, Rice says that by reaching out to those who have your best interests in mind will allow aspiring black owners more access to resources. Network, you know, with other businesses that are, a lot of times we want to say black owned, so you know, it's harder when you try to go and ask information for a Korean media supply store. But there are some other African American stores out there that you can go in and talk to them and the majority of them are open to provide you with information on how they got started. Sharonda Allen is the owner of a salon in Duncanville, Texas called Mimi's Beauty Bar. She says that although black-owned beauty supplies tend to be more expensive because they don't have access to as many distributors and products, they can still have a competitive edge over Korean-owned stores. Either than the relationship and feeling connectivity of just dealing with someone that looks like you, pretty much the only thing they could probably do something homegrown because they have more things that you could buy but not homegrown. You know, as far as all natural products that are actually raw and uncut, they don't offer those type of things. Everything is processed in the Asian stores. So if they did something more homeopathic or something more uh, back to nature, then I think that that would be a good thing. In addition to this, other shifting factors of power have been seen lately in the black hair industry. For one, according to an article in Korea Daily, over the past couple of years, labor prices have spiked in South Korea. As a result, many wig production companies have moved to China for cheaper labor, which has harmed profits in some beauty supply stores. For today's tea, I'm Carlin Green. So ladies, what was your favorite part of homecoming? Uh, let's see. Uh, my favorite part was actually when Kelly Rowland came out. She was literally glistening on stage. I was not ready. And then my second favorite part was actually um, when Beyonce was singing the Black National Anthem, which is also called uh, Lift Every Voice and Sing. That was just majestic. It was magical. And you? Um, i say my favorite part was pretty much every time Beyonce mentioned how she wanted to be hella black. I mean, like she was very specific, like this is what I wanted. I want the um, HBCU experience. So anytime that she highlights, cause a lot of performers, they include that stuff, but they don't make it, you know, it's kind of like matter of fact, or they don't like pinpoint that that's exactly what I was trying to do. But Beyonce did that. And I, I'm glad that she like led us into her, uh, her creative process. It's like what all went into it and like the behind the, the scenes of it. I really love that part. Okay, ladies, so we're about to break down into a dance competition between the two of you. <laughs> and we'll see who does the best at the Before I Let Go Challenge by Beyonce. Okay, ladies, show us what you're working with.
Yes. <laughs> <laughs> to go drop it? Yeah. <laughs> they didn't have to go there. But they did. Yeah. No, no, no. To the floor. Okay. <laughs> Coming up next, there's a local marriage consultant that will literally plan your big day anytime, any place. We'll tell you more after the break. According to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, black mothers are three to four times more likely than white mothers to die from complications during pregnancy. Even Serena Williams, arguably the greatest athlete ever, had complications following childbirth. We're discussing how they alter our relationships with doctors. The next question is, do you have a preference between natural birth or being in a hospital? For me, I actually am leaning more towards natural birth. I don't know if you guys have seen, but um, Kaylani, she did a natural birth and I found that really interesting. So I was doing my research and everything and it just seems more spiritual based and I really love that element to it. I don't know yet. Um, <laughs> I would like to say that I would lean toward a natural birth. My um, first cousin actually did a natural birth and it was beautiful. I think it's very intimate for you and your family. Um, and like you said, very spiritual. Um, however, I'm kind of a punk, so I don't know if I can handle it. <laughs> you have to really be committed to yeah. wanting to do it yeah. and prepare your mind mentally before mm -hmm. you commit to doing a natural birth. Yeah, my, so. my pain tolerance is pretty much probably like a two. <laughs> so I think I'm gonna have to be in the hospital. Uh, you know, much respect to the doulas and the midwives and all that. Mm -hmm. But I just feel like in the event of an emergency, because I'm so science illiterate, I would like to have some machine. You know, just like the like the other resources that would be in the hospital. I just think that would come into effect for me. Um, but I have seen people that have done it naturally and it was beautiful and they like worked out the whole pregnancy and they just pushed that thing out like it was nothing. So I know it's doable, but yeah, Honey, it's probably gonna be know. a no for me, dog. <laughs> <laughs> in 2016, according to blackdemographics.com, only 29% of African Americans were married compared to 48% of all Americans. I spoke with the Dallas wedding planner who gave me insight on why she thinks this is and how she is doing her part to promote and plan weddings across the nation. I am the owner of Jesse Lope LLC, which is an elopement and pop-up wedding planning company um, based here in Dallas. Anywhere you want to get married, we can make it happen. <laughs> the trend of um, a lot of people are wanting to get married and now that we provide an affordable option um, that option is really there for for them a lot of couples have put off getting married simply because it was so much of a financial burden I think that since mainstream has now made being married and marriage uh, more uh, appealing people tend to follow trends and apparently being married is <laughs> the cool thing to um, do, but definitely we see a lot more younger couples, African-American couples getting married. I think it's, it's, it's awesome. Homophobia in the black community is a topic that is considered taboo, but it must be discussed. In 2017, according to the National Coalition Against Domestic Violence, 60% of total murdered LGBTQ people were black. And just recently, Nigel Shelby, a 15-year-old high school freshman, committed suicide after being bullied for being gay. I have here with me Brooke Robertson, who is the president of UNT's Blackout Alliance, an on-campus organization that intersects the black and LGBTQ plus communities. So Brooke, thank you for joining me here today. Thank you for having me. So Brooke, I want to first ask you, actually I want to congratulate you and Blackout on winning Org of the Year, Org of the Semester, and Most Impactful Program. Thank you. So what do these accolades mean for you, your organization, and just the LGBTQ community in general? So for me in particular, um, I started this organization back in spring 2018. So for us to come from an organization that just got started last year to being an organization that took home three awards at spring ball the next year, that really means a lot to me. And just the hard work that me and my exec board has really been 
putting in and I'm just really excited about that. And it also just means that we're being seen and that the vision that we have on campus is being recognized. So recently Morehouse, an all-male HBCU in Atlanta, uh, they announced that in the fall of 2020 they will start admitting any student who identifies as male, so like transgender men. With that in mind, what would be the next step to ensure that these students have a safe and inclusive learning environment? Yes. So while that's great that they're doing that, I think the next step would be uh, to have maybe diversity training for staff and faculty on campus to know how to navigate with those students and help them like with their uh, process and being uh, on campus and being in college as well because um, it is while you are a man it is hard being a transgendered man as well. Also having that representation for them as well on campus uh, if they can hire more transgender men as faculty and staff on campus or even having like mentoring programs or organizations that can be able to help them through that process. Thank you for this interview Brooke. Thank you for having me. Black Twitter is defined as the collective identity of black users on Twitter. According to the Pew Research Center, around 27% of Twitter users are black. Black Twitter is cited with fueling the Black Lives Matter social movement. And in 2018, the Netflix hit film Bird Box, starring Sandra Bullock, reached over 45 million Netflix accounts, making it the best week for a Netflix film to date. Netflix even acknowledged that its massive popularity was greatly due to the influence of Black Twitter. We asked Twitter users what comes to mind when they hear Black Twitter. When you hear the word black Twitter, what comes to mind? Woke with culture, woke with culture, amazing. <laughs> I think of family, like brotherhood, sisterhood. It's lit, it's absolutely lit. We just come with the best memes first, you know. I really just think of just ridiculousness, just funny, just funny stuff. What do you think Twitter would be without black people? Oh, dull, dull, just tasteless. Seasonless, uh, no flavor whatsoever. Uh, they can't do it the same as us, I'll be honest. Just bread, just, just, just horrible, just no, mm-mm. Um, I think it would just be like news, I guess. Um, Twitter would be nothing, honestly. And lastly, we're gonna ask you to imitate your favorite gift or meme. All right. Or you can do multiple, because I just feel like you, you have multiple in you. So let's, let's see what you got. No, you're not. Many. You're not gonna imitate it. No, I can't. It's just too many. It's, oh, it's just like it's just a, like blow into the wind. Just... <laughs> what about this? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> you gonna have a dancing car? I was trying to make somebody dance. <laughs> Aubrey Graham in a wheelchair, Drake. Stop playing with me, man. <laughs> well, it looks like we're out of today's tea. We hope it helped quench your thirst. And if not, we'll be serving even more here on Today's, today's Tea. tea.